Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Jaehaerys the First, Jaehaerys the Conciliator, the old king generally considered to be the finest, the greatest Targaryen king of them all. Uh, as always, I'm going to be shaping this live stream around questions I get from my patrons. I've got one thing I want to announce right at the beginning, um, but other than that, I think I'll just do a broad intro and then we'll just get into as many questions as we can. The thing I wanted to say before we get into this, I mentioned it last week, um, I have a second channel uh, where I am going to be moving all of my live content, not this bit for now, the live streams will remain on this channel for the next few weeks, but I am moving everything like that over onto my second channel, IDG Live. There, I'm sure if you're watching live, the moderators will be putting a link up for you. You can find it, just search for IDG Live. If you're watching back later, there'll be a link down in the description. On that channel, I'll be covering the same things that I do over here, A Song of Ice and Fire, Lord of the Rings, The Witcher, the best in fantasy and science fiction. And the idea there is to do more lifestyle content, more interviews, uh, short form content, uh, live streams, that kind of thing. Over on this channel, we'll be focusing a lot more on the more sort of curated content. I know some people prefer to keep all of that together, so I'm just going to separate out into the two channels, but hopefully the, the new channel will give me a little bit of a chance to experiment, try a few different things, uh, branch out perhaps into a few new areas. I'm really excited. New content is going to be going live on there as of next week. So if you want to go over and subscribe now, that will be absolutely fantastic. OK, advert over. Let's get straight into Jaehaerys. Jaehaerys the uh, first. He uh, was born the third son and fourth child of Aenys the first, King Aenys, the oldest son of Will uh, William the Conqueror, uh, Aegon the Conqueror. Now, this means that Jaehaerys was Aegon's grandson. So we're talking, although we might think of this as being quite some time afterwards, we're talking just a couple of generations after the conquest. And the build-up to Jaehaerys's reign was, uh, it has to be said, quite a quite a hard one for the Targaryens. Aegon and his sister wives, they had established the rule. They had basically made sure that nobody dare oppose them other than Dawn, who obviously held out for a while. Uh, but uh, nobody dared oppose them because they had their dragons, because they made it very clear the moment you oppose, that's it. Uh, we will burn down your castle. We will destroy... Uh, everything you own until you subject yourself to our rule. They were followed by Aenys, who was almost the opposite. He was seemingly quite a good man. This is Jaehaerys' father. Seemingly quite a good man, but indecisive. Uh, he didn't like making decisions. He didn't like opposing people. He wanted people to like him. He was succeeded by Magor, his half-brother, who became known as Magor the Cruel. He, again, it swung round to the other way. He was just everything about burning, pillaging, killing, torturing. torturing. He was not a good person. So when Jaehaerys came to the throne, in which happened after, basically, Magor had been so horrific. We talked about Magor a couple of weeks ago. He'd been so horrific that the entire realm turned against him, and he died in pretty suspicious circumstances on the Iron Throne. Jaehaerys had declared himself, and Jaehaerys took over. He was immediately faced with the fact that the the kingdom, the seven kingdoms that he had inherited, they were not united. They had had many years of mismanagement. The faith, which of the seven, which was the religion that almost everybody practiced outside of places like the North, that was set against him. He had huge amounts of problems to overcome. And he positioned himself, first of all, to be neither his father nor his uncle. He didn't want to be seen as weak like his father, but he also didn't want to be seen as cruel like his uncle. He tried to toe this line down the middle. He ruled very clearly all the way through, 
with his sister wife, Alison. We talked about her last week. And this was, although he was the king, he was the person in charge, he did co-rule. Everybody knew that he co-ruled with her. She had a huge impact on policies. Uh, she had a huge impact on the way that he ruled. And his reign was a good one. It was a peaceful one. There were wars that happened during it, but they were short. They were very restricted. He managed to turn the the antipathy, the hatred of the faith of the seven. We'll talk about this in a little bit more in a moment. But they they were adamantly against him. He managed to get the faith on side. So they weren't opposing Targaryen rule. In fact, they were supporting Targaryen rule. These were massive things. He also did hugely important but quite boring sounding things like having a unified rule book a law book uh, for the entire realm previously you would have one law applying in one part of the seven kingdoms another law applying somewhere else and it was not a unified kingdom he built things like or ordered the construction of things like the king's road making travel between different parts of the seven kingdoms easier. He did things uh, around the new city of King's Landing to actually turn it into a working city. For example, drainage, water supplies, things along those lines that actually made people's lives, normal people's lives, better. The treasury grew, increased, improved during his time. There were ups and downs, but generally speaking, peace, prosperity, trade, boomed and the treasury increased during his lifetime what he would probably view as the greatest sadness uh, he probably wouldn't think failure it wasn't a failure but it was definitely a tragedy was the fact that although he and his wife had 13 children almost all of them died uh, only two survived him, in fact, uh, and both of those had taken themselves out of the line of succession. So by the time we get to the end of his reign, we get to the Great Council of 101, which is what we saw at the very, very beginning of House of the Dragon. And the problem there was that he'd had these 13 children, but they'd all gone. Who is going to take her? over after him who is going to rule after him and they chose Viserys the eldest son of his second uh or living uh, I say not living he died by that point uh, son so his oldest uh, his firstborn son had died a while very young uh, but he had two sons that survived to adulthood one of them um uh, Aemon uh, had a daughter, Reina, that we, uh, Renis, sorry, I should say, who we know, um, the queen who never was, and the other had Viserys and Daemon. So his lasting legacy was a, a peaceful and prosperous kingdom, and Viserys as king. So that is the sort of the overview of of his reign. Lots of interesting things happened during that time. And it's it's noteworthy that whereas you get the um in Fire and Blood, you get the accounts of the first three kings, which go through almost on a month by month basis what happened during their reigns. With Jaharis, there were long periods of time when not much happened. And this is good in terms of ruling a kingdom, not much happening. This allows for there to be a strong economic growth. It allows for ties between different parts of the kingdom to grow stronger. But it means that we're left with this whole series of some of the most interesting, fun stories, um, sometimes the most horror-filled stories of the entire Fire and Blood narrative, but they're almost dotted throughout the reign. It's not this long narrative. So we get 
Alyssa Farman stealing the three dragon eggs. That happened during here. Area Targaryen flying off in Beleriand. That happened during um, Jaehaerys's reign. Um, we get what we talked about last week when um, Alison is at the wall and tries to fly Silverwing, her dragon, north of the wall. That happens during this reign. There are lots of individual incidents which are absolutely fascinating which happen during this reign. But as a whole, the reign was peaceful and without um, massive uh, incidents going on all over the time. Let's have a quick look in the chat. So that's just sort of an overview of um, uh, King Jaehaerys. Uh, Jimadol saying, Ten Hag is the only king I bow to. Yeah, I only just made it here for this live stream. Um, glory, glory, Man United. Um, so... Uh, um, Maylor Baylor message deleted. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, moderators. That was uh, not a uh, good uh, message. Monica Garcia saying, Hi, Robert. Jaehaerys was not the best father, but which of his children do you think he felt the strongest bond with? Um, uh, so, I, I think I do have a question on this a bit later. He does seem to have connected with um, uh, Aemon and Balon, his his two sons who survived for a long time. He seems to have connected well with them. Um, his daughters, less so. Um, so I would probably say, yes, it was Aemon and Balon who he connected with the most. And that's who he pinned his hopes on for uh, succession. That's where he wanted the succession to go. Um, I don't think he necessarily saw himself in any of them. Um, but a lot of his children, he seems to have been perhaps disappointed in is, is probably the uh, the best and most honest way of saying it. So Sarah, his daughter, who he basically ostracized, cut off from uh, from the family. This caused a great rift. Uh, one of two um, quarrels, the two quarrels we're told, uh, with uh, his wife Alison was over Sarah. The other one was over when um, uh, Rhaenys the was not made the next heir. So both times there was a quarrel with his wife. And the word quarrel here is clearly an understatement. This was a full-scale argument leading leaving to an estrangement for a couple of years the first time. I think it was three, four years the second time. These were huge. These weren't just quarrels. This was a absolutely fundamental difference of opinion between uh, marital partners. And both of them were over their their children, their family, and specifically uh, the the women uh, in their family. So, uh, yes, he. I think it's it's probably safe to to simply say um, uh, that he got on best with his sons rather than his daughters. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you very much. Very generous super chat saying, just a show of love and support for your three channels, merch, and all the fabulous stories in the well told tale. Hugs to gorgeous Dan the dog. Thank you so much. You know how much I appreciate your support, Mara. Um, Martin S saying, Magor can be found in pure evil wiki. Only the worst villains without redeeming qualities are found there. Joffrey, Ramsay, Sauron, Morgoth, Sidious, etc. Gandalf and Al Aragorn are on pure good wiki. I. I'm unaware of pure evil and pure good wiki, but um, uh, yeah, I, it, Jaehaerys, um, as you're talking about Magor, yeah, I think that it's very hard. We talked about him a couple of weeks ago. It's very hard. I know some people kind of try and defend him as being a strong king. I, my take on Magor is that, yes, he was a strong king, but even if you try and justify the horrendous things that he did, and he did do horrendous things, it's very hard to justify justify on the grounds that it was effective because the entire kingdom turned uh, away from him within just a few short years. So uh, that's that's my general take on Magor. Jaehaerys, does he deserve to be on the pure good? I mean, I don't 
think so because he he wasn't a pure good person. George R. Martin doesn't tend to write pure good people or pure evil people for that matter. But it, I, there are a couple of marks against him. One is the way that he treated some of the women in his life, particularly Sarah, for example, that we talked about. But also this doctrine of exceptionalism that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it was incredibly clever political move but it did kind of create a hierarchy of um people not just in terms of where you're you know, where you're born in the social structure but saying this race of people are better and have to can obey different rules to all the other kinds of people um question from jake the usurper what gods did the targaryens follow they seem to not really care either way but was there a religion in valyria there was a religion in valyria we're just not told huge amounts about it we're told that there were gods we're told that and it seems that there were many gods we're told some of the dragons were named after the valyrian gods now what do we actually know about that faith? Precious little. We got a few hints in House of the Dragon, it has to be said. Uh, one of the noteworthy things, and I think this is a great little bit of uh, show-don't-tell writing from George R. R. Martin, is the way that the early dragons, uh, when I say early, early on in the Targaryen's reign and rule over Westeros, the dragons were named after... Uh, apparently after Valyrian gods, uh, Beleriand uh, and um, you know Vagar. Th th these are these are names that come from Valyria. As you start moving through, the first few still were Vermithor, for example. But then you start getting the names that are more generic: Sea Smoke, uh, Morning, things like that. And this is showing how the Valyrians have moved from being, so the Targaryens have moved from being very Valyrian to more a part of Westerosi culture. The longer they stay in there, they still have got the dragons, but then not hanging on to their own culture so much. That's another thing I think they did wonderfully in House of the Dragon is try and show where the lines of Targaryen culture were. Obviously, you had. Viserys himself, who was the historian, but you had Damon, who was this example of Valyrian culture. He would talk in Valyrian, he gave gifts of Valyrian steel, he sang his dragon in Valyrian. He was Valyrian, but some of the others, less so. Um, Aegon II, for example, was he very um, Valyrian? Not. Really, you you have to say he was brought up within, effectively, within the faith of the Seven, um, with the High Towers. So, the further down you get um, in the uh, the history of the Targaryens, the less Valyrian they are. But in terms of uh, the what this means for religion, to start with, this was very much we follow our own religion. But by the time you move several generations down, it seems that they may still say that, but they've taken on board the idea of the Faith of the Seven, just saying the Targaryens are over and above that. Um, Monica... Uh, Garcia, another super chat. That, thank you very much. I didn't see a question. Uh, oh, attached to that. Oh, yes, there is one here saying, which of the 13 Targaryen kings that ruled after Jaehaerys would Jaehaerys approve of the most? And which would Alison most approve of? Um, and thank you for the excellent content. And thank you to the moderators. Yeah, early shout out to the moderators. Thank you very much. If you're watching this live and uh, appreciating the fact that the chat is a safe place, then that is because the moderators keep it that way. Uh, they are the real stars of this channel, so uh, please show them a little bit of love. In terms of the um, the kings after Jaehaerys, who would he have approved uh, of the most? Who would Alison have approved of the most? Um, well, we're slightly held back, of course, by the fact that 
we don't have um, all of the details about the, some of the later kings. With Fire and Blood, part one only obviously went up to the very beginning of Aegon III's rule. So we don't have what happened after that. I do think that both Jaehaerys and Alison would have approved in principle with a lot of what Aegon V Egg was up to because he cared about the common people. And this was one of the things particularly Alison cared about. She had, it's the, the women's courts that she went and uh, gained information about what was going on, what the women uh, in Westeros were experiencing, but it wasn't just the highborn women, this was the lowborn women as well. And so she very much cared about the lives of ordinary people. And Jaehaerys and her worked together to care about the lives of the small folk of King's Landing. There's the great story, I don't think I told it last time, but when they were trying to convince the small council that you really do need to be spending a lot of money on all of this sanitation and getting good water supplies into King's Landing, they were having this really tough conversation until Alison came in and poured them all a drink of the river water and said, if you think that we don't need it, then just take a drink of this. And it's all green and murky and they're like, mm, okay, valid point. Um, the two of them worked together on that. So I think probably Aegon V would be closest to their kind of um, ideal. And he was certainly in early in his reign. Again, we don't know all of the details later on. Certainly earlier in his reign, he was very committed to trying to keep the Seven Kingdoms together, not just at the looking after the small folk, but also trying to keep the Seven Kingdoms united um, politically, which was something Jaehaerys was very strong on as well. Um, Kelly Summers saying, I used to be a Jaehaerys stan, but he was so shrewd about public perception and ruled so long. I wonder how much he influenced the history books in his favour like he did with the faith. Yeah, this is something we touched on when talking about Alison. Um, uh, the extent to which what we read about and why we think of Jaehaerys as being such a great king is a result of what we read about in fire and blood and the way that they ruled for so long and they created this perception how much of it is actually real and i think it's probably fair to say that a goodly amount of it is based on the fact that he did do good things that there is there is no doubt good things happened while he was there the the faith the ongoing battles with the faith were ended in his time, by his actions, and that was a good thing. The uh, the kingdom was brought together with the rule book, with the building of the King's Road, with the caring for the small folk in King's Landing. Those kinds of things were done well. He was, I think the other element we have to accept is that there weren't any massive wars that happened during his time. There were a few little rebellions here and there, but there weren't any massive wars. And that meant that he could build a time of peace and prosperity. And while you have a time of peace and prosperity, it's quite easy or a lot easier to look like you're a good ruler. Um, you can, not a political point, but if you go back through history, you could look at the people who were around during times of peace and prosperity. They are often viewed as being good and strong rulers. If you're living during a time of great hardship, yes, you can come out as being amazing, but it's also very easy to come out as being looking as if events overwhelmed you. So Jaehaerys ruling over a time of peace and prosperity did actually help, and that wasn't all uh, to do with him. But what extent of this is his own um, publicity machine? He clearly understood about the need for propaganda. The doctrine of exceptionalism that we will talk about in a moment relied on putting good public speakers out there to try and persuade the people. Um, he was always very clear on trying to make sure that the right messages got out to people. Um, so, and to present the right 
image to people as well. He did not wish to appear like his father, weak. He did not wish to appear like his uncle, cruel. Therefore, he made conscious efforts to be neither of those things. He was very self-aware. But is the reporting of him... Uh, does it make him better than he look better than he actually is? Almost certainly. But I think that, that should not take away from the fact that he did do a, a great many good things. Uh, a reflective rambling saying a shout out to Hi, I'm Alison, who's dropped in right before she gets married today. Uh, well, uh, every blessing to you uh, and and your, your very, very lucky loved one. Um, I hope you have uh, a fantastic marriage and every blessing to you for the rest of your uh, lives together. That's amazing. And well, thank you. I feel honored that you pop in if it's uh, if it's if it is literally just before you get go get married, then um, uh, yeah, I feel honored and go uh, leave this go do do amazing things and live wonderful lives. That's uh, that makes me happy. Uh, thank you, Reflective Rambling, for picking that one up. Um, Amber Muse saying, hello, Robert. Uh, will you be going to Con of Thrones this August in Orlando? Oh, yeah, I didn't mention this last week, actually. So for those of you um, who are interested in these kinds of things, the biggest unofficial Game of Thrones convention is Con of Thrones. It's, be, it's not happened for the last, I think, three years because of COVID, but it is back this summer in August. I don't know the dates off the top of my head. The, it's the last weekend in August, I think. Don't quote me on it. Um, uh, Ed is back. They announced it just about a week ago. I went to the last one, which was in Nashville, and I had an amazing time. Um, I haven't sorted myself out, so I can't commit to going. I would love to go. I hope I can go, but I'm not going to make any promises yet. Um, but uh, if I do, then say hi. If you're there, it would be absolutely fantastic. I will let you know when I uh, when I know myself. I just need to sort out my diary and things like that. But yeah, it should be uh, it should be good. Basically, it's there was an official one towards the end of last year, I want to say, December maybe. Um, but uh, the unofficial one is a lot more fan-led, the Con of Thrones. There is another unofficial one, uh, Con of Ice and Fire, which I've not personally been to, but have heard very good things about as well. Uh, Con of Thrones is very much a fan-led thing, um, has a lot of panels. I was on a few panels last time, um, and does have uh, some of the actors in, um, has cosplay, lots of good things. So um, that's free advertising. I've not been uh, asked to say that. Don't know yet whether I will be going, but I will let you know uh, nearer the time if um, if I am. Um, question from mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, Kirsty Angel. How old was Alison when she went to the north? How long was she there for in total? And how long had she spent there before Jaehaerys met her there? Oh, he's a good masses of detail. She was um, in her twenties. Off the top of my head, I, I can I can find this out. Somebody in the chat will be able to Google this and find out exactly. But I, in my in my mind, she was probably in her late twenties when she went up there. This was on one of the progresses. Uh, one of the things Jaehaerys was very keen to do was to. Uh, meet and greet basically <laughs> go around the realm and meet people and uh they'd been on a couple and then eventually they decided they should go to the north um jaharis got caught up uh, dealing with a dispute between pentos and bravos which meant that he got delayed allison said don't worry i'll carry it. they didn't want to insult the starks because they'd promised to go up there they didn't want to cancel on them so allison said i will head on up there myself. Um, overall, Jaehaerys arrived, I think it was six months after she set off, so they had a good amount of time. She went to White Harbour, she ended up going to Winterfell, she charmed them, she charmed them at White Harbour, she charmed them at Winterfell, then she went on up to Castle Black, from Castle Black she went over to the Night Fort, back down to Winterfell, and that's when Jaehaerys came up. So there was quite a long, this was a long period of time, um, uh, she was there for. Um, but yeah, if somebody in the chat knows their um, uh, the exact dates, then uh, please do 
drop it in. I'll read it out. Uh, Monica Garcia also saying, what do you think of Jaehaerys and Alison's thoughts on Rhaenyra would be? Her claim to the throne, bastards, and her poor decisions during her brief reign. Well, okay, yeah, so this is, a, uh, this is an interesting one. Because one of the two quarrels was effectively over line of succession. And Alison was in favour, basically, of uh, the woman being in the line of succession, and Jaehaerys was not. Now, this was um, this was important in a way to uh, Jaehaerys because if he kind of accepted the fact that the the children of an older son should be inheriting before him. Uh, even if they were women, then he probably, his claim would have been diminished to be on the throne himself. So that's probably part of the reason why he wasn't, because uh, when Magor was on the throne, for example, his heir, named heir, was Aria Targaryen. Aria was the firstborn daughter of the, um, the firstborn son of King Aedes which means that she actually has, if you just go by firstborn, firstborn, she has the greatest claim. Jaehaerys, when he took over, until he had an heir of his own, he al allowed Aerya to carry on as heir. But if he had for one second said, you know what, actually the firstborn of the firstborn should be inheriting, then that would have said put into doubt his own right to rule. So that's probably where that came from. So in the abstract, they would have been split over Rhaenyra because um, Alison would have been absolutely, I'm sure of this, would have been absolutely saying, yes, Rhaenyra should be inheriting. She is the oldest um, and uh, she should be inheriting. Jaehaerys, from what we've seen, probably would say, actually, no, Aegon should be the heir. So they would probably would have had a different view on this. Um, in terms of Rhaenyra, I'll, I'll go into one of my regular rants about tax policy here, actually, because this is quite an interesting one. Rhaenyra, when she took over King's Landing, it, it, I did a video quite recently, actually, about, it wasn't called Rhaenyra's tax policy, it was called something like the economics of the Dance of the Dragons. But this is a central part, and spoilers here, by the way, for House of the Dragon, for when we get there um but this is what happens in the books presume it will happen roughly the same in on the show um so when she took over king's landing they didn't have much money and so her instinct it wasn't just her it was her master of coin uh, lord keltegar taxed everybody absolutely everybody from the highest to the lowest completely just uh every Every home got taxed, every trade got taxed, everything you were doing got taxed, people coming in and out of the city got taxed, everything was taxed. And that raised money, but it also alienated her. The people turned against her. Jaehaerys, when he hired Rego Draz as his master of coin, one of the most successful masters of coin in uh, Westerosi history, we're very clearly told that uh, Jaehaerys was keen to just be taxing luxury items. He did, there were other, some other taxes, but we're told specifically what he wanted to do was tax luxury items because he thought, rightly, that uh, this meant that the, the masses of the people would be unaffected by this and think, oh, what a great guy, he's not taxing us, he's taxing the people who can afford it. The people who could afford it... Um, if they wanted to get the luxury items, they would, they could afford it and they would pay for it anyway. And he seems to have managed to balance that. But the driver for his tax policy appears to be a lot more what we might today call progressive in terms of trying to tax those who can afford to pay it more than those who can't, whereas Rhaenyra was more what we would call a regressive tax policy that impacts more on the poor members of society. So I think they would, uh, Jaehaerys would very much um, disagree with that. Um, I think I had another question. 
Uh, yep, yeah, here we go. Katina saying, what was the dynamic between Jaharis and his older sister, Reina? What do you think Alison thought of Reina? I, why wouldn't she be the ruler? So Reina is a fascinating character who, um, uh, for a huge swathe of fire and blood, she's this kind of loose cannon Targaryen. First of all, um, uh, she she marries uh, her brother, who is the king who never was, the un uncrowned king, Aegon the Uncrowned. Um, then uh, after that, she becomes known as the Queen in the West, the Queen in the East. She never wants to be queen, it seems. Uh, her father died out of anxiety and the, the travails of being king. Her husband, brother, was killed um, by um, Magor. Her other, one of her other brothers, Viserys, was cruelly murdered by Magor. She lost her loves. Alyssa Farman left her. She seems to have been broken by huge amounts of what went on in life and just ended up just sort of clinging to the things that she loved and wanted the most. This It was partly her um, desperation to keep her daughter Aria close to her that led to Aria jumping, trying to escape, jump onto the back of Valerian. So um, uh, what, uh, and so in terms of uh, what the dynamic was, Jaehaerys seemed to have understood that she didn't want, she wasn't competition for him. She didn't want to be king, queen. She didn't want to be in charge. She wanted to live her own life. She was a Targaryen. She wanted to fly her dragons around. But certainly towards the second half of her life, she never went anywhere near either Dragonstone or King's Landing. She just left all of that part of her life there. So I think Jaehaerys, although he cared about his sister and he recognised that she was quite an indomitable woman, he was he was okay with the fact that she just she just stayed away. Um, and I think Alison was probably the same. I don't think either of them would have wished to push that on her. Um, Jaehaerys and Alison, this was, we always try and think the best of them, but them taking the throne was a coup in in one sense of the word they did take the throne away from other people who might have had a better claim uh reina could have had a better claim uh area could have had a better claim um but they uh, because they did then i think that we can probably assume the fact that they it's not that they hated the relatives that they took this away from. They seem to have got on okay with them, but um, certainly with area, there's always a degree of, I think, wariness going on there. Um, I hope that answered, that was a slightly rambly uh, way of, of coming around to that. So I hope that um, does answer the question, but Raina didn't want to be ruler. And I think that that just made the whole thing a lot easier. Uh, Frozen Whirlpool saying, if Jaehaerys knew the end of Targaryen power would be directly connected to his prejudice against female rulers, it would have uh, would it have changed his mind? Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's quite hard to to say um, exactly what drove him. I, th I think that the only thing that we can say is that he knew. It's never really spelled out in Fire and Blood, but he knew that his own legitimacy depended on this idea that the woman wasn't going to inherit um if he got told that him passing that down to the next generation or the generation after that was uh could potentially change things yeah i guess so because he will have had that um prophecy the prophecy of ice and fire that got passed down to him and he will have held close to that he will have held that tight so the importance of Targaryen rule and the importance of the unified seven kingdoms will have been important to him. But fundamentally, his his prejudice um, against female rulers um, 
I don't think that made any difference because this was just a prejudice which was there in all of Westeros to start with. And uh, whatever he wanted, um, it was the lords of the realm who voted for um, Viserys. And whatever Viserys wanted, it was other people pushing against his choice for Rhaenyra that created the civil war to come. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we can directly blame him. He's not in the right here, but I don't think we can directly blame him for what followed. Uh, Philip saying, I would give anything to see casual fans' reaction to the fireworm scene if or when House of the Dragon ever adapts the Jaehaerys chapters. Yeah, so I, I this is the area Targaryen scene, which is as close as he gets in Fire of Blood to outright horror. Um, and yes, it's that, and Blood and Cheese, I think, is the that's the other one, which is surely horrific. But um, would I mean I've asked myself this a lot whether they would or could do Jaehaerys's reign. I think this will be really quite hard because of the fact that it is lots of isolated incidents over a long period of time, half a century or so. And how do you do that? It, it most of the the non-obsessives, uh, not us, people who watched um, House of the Dragon, the most common thing that came back to me as by way of criticism, almost everybody loved it, but the most common criticism I heard was the the time skips, the changes uh, in actors. Not that they disliked any of the actors, they thought the actors were good, but it was like, okay, so where are we at now? We've moved on in time, who are these new people? Just keeping a hold of that. And so I think that would be even harder if you have to change who your main character is um, two or three times from young Jaehaerys, who was too young to even rule when he first came to the throne, to being the old king that we saw at the very beginning of uh, House of the Dragon. I think that would be really quite hard to do. Um, I do wonder whether they could do that as an anime. But uh, yeah, that, in terms of that particular scene, yes, that would be um, really quite impressive. Uh, Denise Cahan, welcome to the uh, Members Club. Uh, great to have you on board. Um, got any more questions? I think I have got a couple more questions. Let's see. Here we go. Question from Ranabea Mitra saying, uh, Evening, Robert and the lovely mods. Could you expand on Jaehaerys and Alison's tax policy and if it changed during Viserys' rule? Also, up the reds. Well, a glory, glory, Man United. Not a football... Um, uh, not a football uh, stream at all, but uh, yeah, I was uh, I was watching earlier at uh, Manu fans. Now the tax policy, um, the the biggest thing about the tax policy, I've already talked a little bit about the the instinct towards more sort of progressive taxes, but the the biggest thing across the period of uh, Jaehaerys's rule in terms of tax policy was the uh, the bringing it all together into one tax policy across the piece what had previously happened was particularly when you get things like port taxes um you would get one port lannis port say uh charging incredibly low port fees and somewhere else charging incredibly high port fees and there'll be big competition between them. He tried to bring this all together so that it was something manageable for the entire Seven Kingdoms. Um, and he tried to make sure that the, the rule system was established, not just in terms of what's the punishment for stealing a sheep kind of laws, but also what are the, the taxation and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, so apologies for the the slight delay. The the system which they had very broadly, George R. R. Martin doesn't actually go into it for all of his talk about the importance of understanding tax policy. He doesn't actually go into this, so we're left to kind of fill in a few of the the gaps. But it does seem to have been broadly a feudal system where the the people at the top things get funneled up towards them, so the people at the bottom would pay a 
portion of of their income which may be money or it may be the amount of grain they get and that gets passed on up um, and in return then the people higher up they off they provide um defense you can come and come into our castle if, if the baddies come and attack us that kind of thing that got brought together a whole lot more under Jaehaerys' rule. So it was more a matter of um, creating this infrastructure that we have that will allow trade to flow between different parts of the Seven Kingdoms um, and also creating a fairer tax system that is a little bit more transparent for everybody. But maybe I will do one on, um, I'm always looking for my next um, uh, the tax policy of video, because uh, that's so much fun. Uh, maybe I will do one on Jeff Harris's tax policy. Um, Martin S, where does the family name Hightower come from? Did they have a Hightower built somewhere inspiring it, or is it just a name picked for sounding fancy? Well, it is it is sounding fancy, but it is from the High Tower, uh, which is in Old Town, this massive tower. Now... George R. R. Martin, and I think in the build-up to House of the Dragon, I think it was the first time he explicitly said it like this, the, the High Towers are the oldest family in Westeros. And just to put some kind of a context to this, the, the High Tower that we know of, the great stone structure that we uh, that we think of, if you think when Sam on Game of Thrones, he went down to Old Town and you see the great high... The, the lighthouse, the great high tower there. That was built, so legend has it, or the architect, legend has it, was Bran the Builder, which puts it at the same time as the beginning of Winterfell. Now, whether it actually was Bran the Builder or not, who knows, but the fact is it does appear to have been roughly the same sort of time. So when the high tower that we know of was being built was around the time that House Stark was being founded, However, that wasn't the first high tower. There were four high towers before that. This was attempt number five. They, before they'd done wooden things, and even before that, the basis of the high tower on Battle Isle, this island in the uh, in the middle of Old Town, um, that has got a fused black stone fortress down right in the depths of it that all of the other towers are built up on. So. The High Towers. This is just um, a name which came from the High Tower, um, as far as we can tell. Uh, so um, there's no. I don't think there's a huge mystery to it. I think. I think it's just that the mystery is where did they come from? Why were they there? And what happened to in that area? Why is it called Battle Isle, for example? Um. Question from Kristomirakov saying, but they didn't take the throne from those people who had the better claim. They took it from Magor, who did not have a better claim. This is very true. But uh, if you say, uh, the, the reason why I'm saying about his claim is that if you say Magor... Uh, he should not let's just wipe him out from he was he was a a, a false king he should not have uh have been counted a king then you say well who should have been counted as king well aegon the uncrowned was therefore we should count him as a king and who should be inheriting after him presumably his children his daughter area jaharis took the throne and basically implicitly says actually no the throne should not go to Aegon's child, it should go to me instead. So his claim rested on the fact that he was the oldest male descendant from um, Aenys and implicitly um, Aegon the Conqueror. So so that's where his, his claim came from. And it doesn't really matter, therefore, whether you, you count... Um, uh, Magor as being a true or not true king. Jaehaerys was taking it or claiming that it was rightly his rather than um, the area Targaryen. Um, and uh, Uzay Ahmed, did you do research on Murad the Fourth being connected to Magor Targaryen? I'm afraid I didn't. I did. I I've been a bit busy this week i'm afraid um 
Uh, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll probably tweet this out, but uh, yeah, I was in Madrid for a few days this week, which was fantastic, um, wonderful city, um, and I went to the best geek store I think I've ever been to. Um, I will tweet that out. Uh, so yeah, I'm in Deep Geek over on Twitter, so uh, keep an eye out for that. There's some fantastic um, uh, photos I got from there. Anyway, let's go to um, Diego Godoy. Some questions from my patrons. Saying, hola, Robert. Hola. One of the things that was very surprising to me about Jaehaerys' life was when he chose to personally fight the trial by combat versus Braxton Beesbury. He was obviously upset by everything um, that their daughter Sarah had done, but him personally fighting that duel seemed like putting too much at stake, the king's life, for a trial that he could have lost. Did this seem out of character to you? Um, I think it did the first time. I read the book. The first time I read the story, I can remember thinking, why is Jaehaerys here, who, he wasn't an old man at the time, but he was certainly a middle-aged man, uh, why is he personally taking part in trials by combat? Um, this seems the kind of thing that you would put, uh, you, you would delegate down to a member of your Kingsguard or something like that. I think there are a couple of things to this. The first one is that this clearly, this was over the behavior of his daughter, Sarah, which clearly impacted him on a very personal level. And he felt personally slighted um, by what happened. And so he personally wanted to be involved. But was it out of character? I think not. The, the second time I read through it, you notice that there is actually another time when he very nearly does this. When he takes over, as uh, as king, question is what do you do with the the king's guard? Um, and he basically gives them a chance. Do you want to be killed? Because these are the people who have supported Magor, and does he really want them to be surrounding him? Perhaps not. Um, does do they want to be killed? Do they want to go join the Night's Watch? Most of them join the Night's Watch. One of them says, uh, "I want to try by combat." And uh, Jaehaerys says, okay, I'll do that. But he gets banned by his mum. His mum turns up and says, nope, you're not doing that. Um, and at the time, she uh, she was regent, so she could. Uh, but it shows that he was wanting to do this. Why was he wanting to do this? Well, this is a fascinating thing that we picked up on a little bit earlier about his drive to not be like his father as well as not be like his uncle. His father had never been a fighter. This is Amis. He had been uh, seen as a weak king and one of Jaehaerys' concerns was that he did not personally want to be seen as a weak king. He wanted to appear to be a strong king. He wanted to balance that with uh, being magnanimous, which he was. He forgave a lot of people. Um, he basically said, even if you supported Magor and you bend the knee, then that's it. It's all going to be okay to the lords. Um, but he did not wish to appear weak. And so when he had this period of time uh, on Dragonstone, him and Alison, when he was king, but he was too young to rule, he spent time on Dragonstone and he trained himself to be a warrior. It, and we're told that he perhaps originally wasn't that much of a fighter, but he was incredibly focused and incredibly driven and he made sure that he became a warrior. He became a good fighter and he had the sword, uh, Blackfire, of course, as well. So um, as a young lad who's just become king, who wishes to show that he's not like his father, that makes absolute sense. Later on in his life, that part of him is still there. But then there gets this um, real sense of personal injustice uh, that comes out, which is what leads him to be fighting uh, that trial later. Um, question from a username, username redacted. What non-royal nobles pushed for or established the great councils? The councils seem ripe for corruption, favoritism, and scheming. They are. Um, 
Now, let's... Well, we'll focus on the Great Council of 101, which is the, the one that we see at the very beginning of House of the Dragon. I did a video, I can't remember what I called this, but this is it was part of the Maester Conspiracy kind of uh, feeling. Because the, the situation was that Jaehaerys, he needed to know, he needed a new heir, and there were basically a couple of different options. Which way did he go? And he wanted to ensure that the kingdom would not split apart. And he had one son left living, uh, Vagon, who had gone down to Old Town to become a maester. I think he was an archmaester by the time uh, of the Great Council. And Jaehaerys meets him and talks to him in private. And at the end of it, it turns out that Vagon has persuaded him to have a great council. Who was behind it? The Maesters. Was this a good idea? One could argue that it was a good idea. However, I think in that video, I noted that it's this is all done by the Maesters. The Maesters, Maesters suggested it, the Maesters ran it, the Maesters counted all the tallies, um, and the Maesters announced the results without saying how many votes everybody got. But we are told that it was 20 to 1 in favour of Viserys, which seems mind-blowing, because when you read that passage in uh, Fire and Blood, you go, okay, so if this was 20 to 1 in a secret ballot, you would expect the vast majority of people to be, 95% odd of people to be voting for Viserys. So we should be hearing that in the lead up to this, it was very obvious everyone was there in favour of, uh, of Viserys. But that's not what we read in Fire and Blood. We read House of Valarion, obviously, were they voted the other way. Plus, you also had um, House Stark voted the other way. I think the Arryns might have done. You had, I think, the Celtigars did. Maybe the, I think it was the Brackens did. You just had this whole list of these noble houses who clearly voted against it, who would have had sway. And it does not sound like a 95% overwhelming victory to me, the way that you read it. 95% is the kind of in a in a democracy, however vague it is, that's that's dictatorship kind of levels. That's when somebody makes sure that they are it, the vote looks good for them. So, um, who who set up that one? That was the Maesters. Did the Maesters um, manipulate it? Probably is my best guess, but we simply do not. No. In terms of corruption, favoritism, and scheming, as you say, that we're told there were bribes. We're told there were massive bribes that went on all over the place. Corlys Velaryon was throwing money all over the place, but it didn't it didn't work for him. Gabe, what are your thoughts on the fact that it took so long for another king with the name of Jaehaerys to ascend the throne, considering that he was for many the best king? Um yeah, well. I think my thoughts on this are that Aegon is the name of the uh, the first king, and so most people, although Jaehaerys may have been considered the great king, um, if you were going to try and associate your child with greatness of House Targaryen, your first choice would probably be Aegon rather than Jaehaerys. The second thing to note is that the Targaryen family tree doesn't go in a straight line down. Uh, it's for a couple of reasons, largely moves about from place to place, to not just to be where you might accept a king uh, passing it on to his eldest son, to his eldest son, to his eldest son. It simply does not work that way. Quite a lot of them, when you look at a brother succeeds a brother or something along those lines. Um, and there are a couple of massive moments where huge amounts of people are taken out of the family tree, like the Dance of the Dragons, but also the 20 something year period when Bloodraven is Hand of the King, you get 
Targaryens dying literally at a rate of one a year. And there aren't many Targaryens, um, which is incredibly suspicious. But the, the family tree gets winnowed down to a very, very small number of people very, very quickly in those two periods of time. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, the brother to brother thing, you wouldn't call two brothers by the same name. Um, and then secondly, the Aegon thing is probably the name they would go for more. And then they just have had a habit of getting wiped out. So you get quite a few with random other names. Um, question from, uh, I think I've got one more in the chat here. Kristomir Rakov saying, sorry about the off topic, but I'm infamous for my love of Sorella Sand. Uh, do you think George R. R. Martin can find time to give her a proper storyline in Winds? Um, oh, good question. So, um, yes, off topic. I'll, I'll quickly address this one. So Sorella Sand, this is one of the sand snakes. The sand snakes in the books are massively different and more interesting and more varied than the sand snakes on the tv show sorella sand almost certainly is uh Aleris, uh who is in um old town she is there in that group that sam meets up with who were studying under marwin the mage um this is an echo of her father um the red viper over in martell who also studied in Old Town. Now, is she going to have time to have a proper plot? Uh, she will be involved over there. The The question is the, the fact that she's being referred to as the Sphinx. Who is she is the question. Um, and is it just a matter of unmasking who she is? I think there's probably a little bit more. Why is it that the Dornish have got somebody over there? Is it just because she's interested in studying? That's possible. Um, or is there some other element of Dornish master plan going on over there? The big problem for all of the old town um, plots is the fact that they are probably on a timer before something massive happens. Euron, he, he's got a massive sea battle just all set up, and once that's happening, the logical place for him to be going next is Old Town. So how long has Sam got there? How long has Jack and Hagar got there? How long has, uh, has uh, Sorella got there? Um, not long. Half a book would probably be my guess. Um, and somebody will die in that. I'm absolutely sure somebody at least will die. A character that we know, not Sam, I'm pretty sure. Um, not uh, Euron himself, I'm pretty sure. I suspect probably Jack and will survive and get out of it. But somebody that we know surely will die because this is George R. R. Martin. So I think it's up in the air. Um, she will have book time in the next book, but I don't think that that necessarily equates to her having a full plot. Raven's Oath. Do you think uh, Jaehaerys's coldness or anger comes from disappointment in his family or the immense stress from wanting to be a good king? Uh, well, yes, it was stressful, wanting to be a good king. I do not doubt that. I think that there was an increasing anxiety, I suspect, when his children kept on dying. He, If he did have this burden of the prophecy, the Aegon's prophecy, the prophecy of ice and fire, the song of ice and fire, passed down to him, knowing that he had to uh, hold together the Seven Kingdoms, keep the Targaryens on the throne, and thinking, I've... I've had, my wife and I have had 13 children. How, how many more do I need to, to have just to get this um, to the next generation? That will definitely have been playing on his mind, I'm absolutely sure. Uh, but, um, I mean, it may be we need more of a, and this is, perhaps somebody needs to do a, a, an essay on this or something, but the 
the reaction that Jaehaerys had about his daughter Sarah was very strong. Not just a strong, it was very strong. It was more, even more than you would expect from somebody who was a proud person who seems to have had some quite upright personal morals. He doesn't seem to have, for example, unlike most Targaryens, he seems to have never had um, concubines or mistresses or anything like that. He seems to have remained faithful to Alison, as far as we can tell. Um, so those things add up to there being something else. Now, I would love to hear what suggestions on what that might have been, because there will be a psychological reason in there somewhere. Um, so, yes, stress from being a good king, but there is more to it than that. Martin S. Is there any position in Westeros with very high social standing but little actual political power? Like the monarchs in present day European parliamentary monarchies um, have high standing but little power. Um, mm, I mean, I think certainly when you move later on the Targaryen reigns, then the High Septon had less and less political power. Well, while they were based in Old Town while they could still raise armies, uh, while they um, had not signed up to the doctrine of exceptionalism, um, they had huge power. But High Septons, High Septons, the further into the Targaryen realm you get, the more they just support the status quo. They are a figurehead. Um, so I think that's probably the closest we have. Um, they, the, the modern idea of this kind of separation of the head of state and the head of government has not yet quite reached, uh, the, Westeros hasn't quite reached that uh, part. So we do have this separation between the king and the hand of the king. Uh, but that feels a lot more like the, uh, for students of uh, Tudors and Stuarts, um, the more like Henry VIII and how he worked with his uh, right hand uh, man, Cromwell, Thomas Cromwell. Um, Thomas Cromwell was the equivalent of the hand of the king ran the country, um, hugely powerful, but no one was in any doubt that the moment that the king decided he didn't like Thomas Cromwell, Thomas Cromwell was gone. That's So they hadn't quite moved on to this position now where we have in a lot of, say, Western European democracies that have uh, royal families still, where the royal families have status but no power over governing. They've not reached that point yet. Um, let's go to a question from the king's road saying g'day robert g'day uh, first of all i want to say i am all in such a harris fanboy he's the man even if fire and blood is a bit of propaganda for him i'd like to hear your thoughts on his bond with vermithor can you tell us about jaharis riding the bronze fury into battle and talk about how jaharis may have interacted with vermithor in relation to valyrian culture as we see Damon singing to him in show canon 80 plus years after he was initially claimed uh, to try and calm him. Okay, so I've got, I think, a really interesting uh, thing to pick up on with Vermithor in House of the Dragon um, that I mentioned at the time, but I kind of got lost in the excitement of everything that was um, happening at the end of the House of the Dragon. So I'll talk about that and Damon singing to him in just one moment. Vermithor was placed into Jaehaerys' uh, cradle and hatched, and that's how they bonded. So this was a, a dragon which grew up with Jaehaerys. They did seem to have a strong bond, um, and he did indeed ride him into battle. He was quite a hands-on king, as we've seen, and there was, it was known as the Third Dornish War, I think. Um, <coughs> pardon me, the where he and a couple of his sons went in and just basically burned the invading Dornish fleet. Um, this was a very, very silly attack by the Dornish, uh, but 
it meant it was an easy victory for the Targaryens. And they came back and they were acclaimed as having achieved a victory with no losses, something Aegon the Conqueror had never managed to do. So this was, uh, a, 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 I mean, it was an easy victory, but it got huge amounts of uh, acclaim. So their bond seems to have been really strong. You see all the way, if you go all the way as far as the Dance of the Dragons, uh, that you get um, Silverwing and Vermithor, him and Alicent's dragons, seem to have a bond that stays all the way through to there. So um, he used it, he used Vermithor as much as anything as a threat. The big thing there was that he, yes, he did ride Vermithor into dragon, in, into battle, but more than anything else, he used him as a threat. He would, we get a couple of instances of this when he basically, he just, he, he doesn't um, explicitly ever say anything, but he just kind of like points at his dragon and basically says, I've, I've got a dragon guys, don't push me. Um, when he goes on his progresses, his meet and greets around uh, Westeros, he always takes his dragon. This was um, partly a reaction to the fact that um, uh, uh, his brother and sister had been caught without their dragons, um, which at the wrong time, because they'd gone on their progress, um, and uh, Aenys, their father, had basically said no, if one of you's got a dragon, the other one hasn't, you can't, because it would make the king look bad if the queen was riding a dragon and the king wasn't, or the uh, the king to be the, the next in line. Uh, so Jaehaerys learned from that and always took his dragon. In terms of Vermithor, though, in House of the Dragon, I wanted to, and this is a slight digression, um, but I wanted to read to you the um what was said what was actually the lyrics of what was said so let me see whether i can be clever with this here we go these are the this is what damon sung to vermouth or you'll remember basically war is going to happen um Aegon II has claimed the throne, um, the High Towers have launched their coup, and Daemon goes out, he goes up, finds Vermithor, this dragon, and he sings to him. And these are the words. So um, if you're just doing the audio rather than the video, I've just put it up on the video for people to see, but the words are fire breather, winged, this is a translation from um, High Valyrian, fire breather, winged leader, uh, but two heads to a third sing. From my voice the fires have spoken, and the price has been paid with blood magic, with words of flame, with clear eyes, to bind the three, to you I sing. As one we gather, and with three heads, we shall fly as we were destined, beautifully, freely. Now, this is, um, this is fascinating, because this isn't just uh, some... Uh, nice words thrown together by the showrunners. These these words actually come from um, uh, T. McKell and they were and David J. Peterson. Now, as I understand it, the first three verses were written by T. McKell, the fourth by David Peterson, and they were translated into High Valyrian by David Peterson. David Peterson is the person who. He's the godfather of, of High Valyrian, he's the and Dothraki, he's the person who has basically invented the language. George R. R. Martin has been very open. Yes, he's a language person, but he's not a philologist. He's not J.R.R. Tolkien. He makes he's for both High Valyrian and Dothraki, he invented several words, but the language itself, David Peterson, is the person who's been developing this. T. McKell, many people won't know about, but T. McKell has been long-time assistant to George R. R. Martin. And not just like bringing him cups of coffee kind of assistant, she is also there being his right-hand person um, with his memory of things going on in Westeros, uh, um, helping him out with a few little prompts here and there. She's not co-writing or anything like that. There's no idea of that. He is writing the book on his own, but she is closer to him than 
at this moment in time, as I understand it, almost anyone else in terms of the writing process, or certainly was, before she moved over onto House of the Dragon, uh, where she uh, has been there as part of in season one as the part of the the writing team. So this is as close to sort of canon type writing as we're going to be getting from the show in terms of those particular words. And I I would love to, at some point, I will do a video about exactly what those mean, because I think the, the, there's so much packed in there. Um, but the, the headline of that, coming back to the question about Damon singing to Vermithor, this is Damon preparing Vermithor to bond again with another dragon rider. That seems to be what's going on here. Um, this is, uh, he's not doing the bonding himself. He's not going to bond with Vermithor, but he is preparing the way. Now, the interesting thing is where, where the three come in. Three is, is mentioned a few times. Clearly, a dragon is one. The dragon rider will be another. Is there a third person who kind of brings them together? Or is the three merely some kind of extra echo of this idea of three heads of the dragon. I will do a video on this at some point, but it's absolutely fascinating. But the headline of all of this is that what was happening there was Damon trying to pave the way so that they can have more dragons. Um, so uh, I hope you found that one quite interesting as a, as a random uh, digression. Um, let's give a quick flick through the chat. Um, uh, uh, Andrew Kay saying, I loved during that scene the repeated close ups between Damon and Vermithor's eyes. Yes, very much um, uh, trying to show the link between Targaryens and dragons in there. Um, Refractive rambling, no, not being sung. I have spared you that. Um, Silver Scale saying, Wonder who are the three heads yet? Yeah, this is the most fascinating thing about that. Um, Andrew Kay talked about Amy uh, forbidding uh, uh, his daughter to take his dragons um, on family progresses, showed weaknesses, while Jaehaerys's showed strength. Um, yep, a lot of uh, good things going on there. Let's go to a, another question from one of my patrons, Mara Lee, saying, why was Jaehaerys known as the conciliator? Well, this is... Um, I think this is quite a nice title to have. Of all the different titles that some of the Targaryens have, um, I think this is uh, a good one. He could have been called lots of different things. He could have been, and he was later on known as the Old King, for obvious reasons. Um, but he wasn't called Jaehaerys the Wise, Jaehaerys the Golden, Jaehaerys the Great, or anything like that. It was the Conciliator. And he was known by this broadly for the first half of his time as king. Why? Because the kingdom was broken around him when he came to power. The kingdom was, it had a whole load of people who'd supported Magor. It had the faith of the seven who were against him. Um, it had um, two different parts of the family tree pulling in different directions. This was not a united kingdom when he took over. And what he did was he conciliated. He brought people together. He was very open with the fact that if random lords came to him and said, yeah, I was on the wrong side. I supported Magor. I see the error of my ways. He would sort of give them his blessing, uh, help them back up, he might confiscate some lands or something like that, but he wasn't going to kill them, he wasn't going to demote them or anything like that, they could carry on. He conciliated the nation. So that's why he was called the conciliator. Is that how history remembers him? Probably not, but that was a hugely important part of his reign, that early part of conciliation going on. And this helped him. The subplot this reputation he built in his early years. The subplot to when uh, Alison went north uh, to Winterfell into the wall was that Jaehaerys was there. Um, as an honest broker, 
between Pentos and Bravos because his reputation had spread far enough. They said, okay, the one person, the only person we really trust to be this conciliator for us is King Jaehaerys. So they got, they persuaded him to get round the table with them. So that was, that was why he got given that name. I think one of the things I do wonder is whether or not he perhaps um, could have been called uh, Jaehaerys the Great or something like that if he hadn't already got that name from quite early on. Um, George R. R. Tolkien saying, Salutations, Robert. Salutations to you too, sir. I wanted to ask you about Jaehaerys' ties with the Hightowers. It seems he trusted them a bit too much, so much so Viserys ended up relying on him. That's uh, way too sus. Don't, uh, do you know why? And also, I wanted to ask you about Raina, uh, Raina's threat to Robar Baratheon. Do you think she had a dragon dream that didn't come true about Robar, Robar finding another woman? She was a rider of Dreamfire. Too much of a stretch? Um, possibly. So, yeah. Um, I've I've speculated in the past to this idea that Raina, who is, as I say, she was this great, indomitable character who sort of moved around, never seemed to want the throne herself, um, Queen of the West, Queen of the East, um, but she rode Dreamfire, and Dreamfire is the dragon that Helena will later bond with, and if there's anyone in those early stories you think maybe that person is a dragon dreamer, then probably I'd go with Raina. So yes, that's entirely possible on your uh, that theory there. In, in terms of the relationship between Jaehaerys and the Hightowers, uh, the where this stems from, it would appear, is one of these early moments in his reign. So the the realm was divided, as we say. When he came to power, the realm was divided, and he immediately knew he could not allow the faith of the seven to keep their um, power because that would always be threatening the Targaryens. So he had to get a few things done. First of all, he had to um, justify in some way the Targaryens not being under the law of the Faith of the Seven. This is where the doctrine of exceptionalism comes in. I'll talk about that in just a bit more in a moment. But he sent people out spreading this news. Secondly, he, he had to disarm the faith. He had to make sure that the faith could no longer make armies to be marching against the Targaryens. So he did that. The third thing was to make sure that the High Septon was on side. And the way that he did this was that when the High Septon, just a few years into his reign, when the High Septon died, he and Alison flew straight away over to Old Town and just landed their dragons there. Uh, Alison literally landed atop the high tower and they landed the dragons there and basically with the, the pretense that they wanted to be there um, to uh, for the, the burial of the, the old High Septon and also to get the new High Septon's blessing. But really, this was a show of force. This was a show of force to make sure that the new High Septon that was chosen would be one that would support them. And we're told that there were long, long discussions between uh, Jaehaerys and Lord Hightower at the time. About what? Well, we weren't in the room. We're not told what, what happened exactly, but what very clearly did happen was that the next um, uh, High Septon was one of these seven people who'd been going out preaching about how wonderful the Targaryens were, who was an incredibly old man. And when he died, then the High Towers themselves took, basically, they took over again um, the, the faith. And they seem to have struck an agreement. The exact wording of that agreement isn't clear, but they seem to have struck an agreement that the... Uh, as long as the faith stayed in its lane, as long as the faith did not push back against the Targaryens, then the Targaryens, Jaehaerys, would allow um, the uh, the Hightowers to be running things as they wished. So 
Is that relationship too close? It was absolutely necessary. It was complete realpolitik from Jaharis. It was very sensible. It was making sure that his the biggest threat against his rule, which is basically mob rule, but the only people who could get everybody on their side would be the faith. They he brought them on side with that discussion, and the only people who could achieve that would be the high towers. So it was necessary. It was realpolitik. He did it. Um, did this then mean that th by the time we got to Viserys, the next king after him, Viserys trusted the High Towers too much? Perhaps. But I don't think we can blame Jaehaerys for that at all. I think that he did what he needed to do and he couldn't possibly look a half a century or more into the future uh, to what um, uh, an as yet unborn High Tower might uh, get lofty ambitions for. Uh, let's go to question in the chat from a Dillo fan saying, I heard the theory that the third head of the dragon in the song is a Targaryen ancestor who was sacrificed via blood magic, allowing Targaryens to bond with dragons. The third head is their spirit. Well, I think that's great. Uh, a really interesting theory. So the, the, the bonding that is being sung about in that does seem very much to be associated with uh, the sacrifice has been made, the price has been paid, the blood magic has been done. So it's very clear that the dragon bonding that happens later on with the Targaryens doesn't have that. They drop an egg into a, a cradle and then the child bonds with the dragon. They don't seem to as far as we can tell, they don't seem to do a special sacrifice. They don't seem to do any particular blood magic in order to make that happen, which does seem to imply that maybe this was something that has happened. As per the song, it was in the past tense. The price has been paid. The blood magic has been done. Something in the past. So I do like this idea. I think this is probably the best. Uh, I, said, sorry, I will do a video on this at some point. I think this is probably the best theory we've got so far, that in order to make the Targaryens be dragon riders, there had to be a big blood sacrifice um, way back in time uh, that has carried on uh, and sort of gets passed down through the generations. Callie Summers uh, saying, we blame Bloodraven for later Targaryen die-offs, but Jaehaerys had a succession crisis too. Was this the children, the faceless men, someone else, or just bad luck? Yeah, I think I think this is mostly just bad luck, to be honest. We could, if you wanted to, you could um, say, and this is really going down the tinfoil hat with, with Blood Raven, you could still blame Blood Raven, of course, because although he wasn't born at that time, by the time he gets hooked up to the Weirwood Network, he can go back through time and influence things in the past, potentially. Um, though he claims not, he claims that the uh, that you can't change the past. It does seem that you can certainly a little bit in George R. R. Martin's world, and when I say that, it does seem you we do basically hear Bran calling out to his father and also to Theon, so he does seem to be able to influence events in the past. But my my instinct is that this is just bad luck. That that sometimes this does happen. Um, you get some certainly in medieval times, even with highborn families. Then, if you have that many children, you would expect some to be um, uh, to not survive past childhood, um, and. Targaryens do go into war quite a lot, so some of them will get killed. Uh, I I love looking for conspiracies in this, but I, and this one I think it probably is just bad luck. Um, <laughs> Kelly Summers saying, the one time I don't give you a tinfoil question, you go down the tinfoil road. Well, you know, you have to, have to balance these things. Um, there's um, Andrew K saying, unless I'm wrong, I read somewhere that uh, has been somewhat clarified the Valyrians practiced familial incest, which could play into dragon bonds being familial tied. Yes, absolutely. That, that does seem to be the case. Um, George R. Martin, in that uh, interview with uh, Aziz Nashar, History of Westeros, he did 
uh, answer when they were saying something like, did the, all the Valyrians do um, uh, practice incest? And he's saying, no, just the dragon riders, because yeah, the others don't, they, they would, didn't need to, which certainly seems to imply that it is the bloodline that was the link into the dragon bonding and the dragon riding. So there is some kind of familial thing going back. We don't know all the details yet. And George R. Martin probably won't give us all of the details because in that same interview, he was very clear. He thinks that magic should be mysterious. He's not going to give us all of the exact details of how to do a spell. He wants us to sort of have a vague understanding of it, but then be uncertain because in the uncertainty, that's where the magic lies. That's where the mystery is. And he likes that. Um, about uh, halfway through, what I always try and do at this time is to say thank you, patrons. Uh, I cannot do what I do without your support, so um, I hugely appreciate that. That's why I frame these live streams around my patrons' questions. Uh, and also the other thing, as I said at the very beginning of the stream, but if you're just joining now, I have got a second channel. Um, IDG Live, which I'm going to start putting new content on, brand new content on there, uh, exclusively on there, as of next week. So if you're interested in that, go and uh, check it out. You can just search for IDG Live and you'll find it nice and easily. There will be a link in the chat, or if you're watching back a, a bit later, I'll make sure there's a link down in the description. But let's go to a question from uh, Ty Farnsworth, or perhaps T. Farnsworth, saying, hey, Robert, thanks again for all you do for the community. Thank you very much. A long-time listener uh, wanted to shout out your Traveller's Guide series, which helped to keep me occupied during the early days of the pandemic. Yeah, that was a long time ago, but I really enjoyed doing those. My question for today, what was the power dynamic between Jaehaerys' eldest children? Had he not outlasted them, would succession have been clean and easy for the eldest son, or would another have tried to usurp the, claim, the, the throne? Yeah, they seem to have been very close from what we hear uh, the next two sons. There doesn't seem to have been any problem there. Um, uh, so I, th I think the short answer and it is a short answer. It would have been okay. The, the only issue was the fact that uh, they did die, and so that muddied the, the line of succession a little bit. But while they were alive, if they'd survived, then yes, there's no reason to think that there wouldn't have been a, uh, an, an easy um, succession. Uh, AK Channel TV saying, hello, Robert. Hi. Uh, busy with uni, but I wanted to pop in. When you have covered all of the rulers, would you consider doing a live ranking of kings and queens? Um, <coughs> yes. I mean, I'm not a big fan of just doing rankings because it all, it all depends on what you're ranking them on. Um, uh, effectiveness, how good a person they were. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I, uh, but I'll have a think about it. I will definitely do some kind of wrap up of, of it all uh, and try to think of some way to pictorially show um, where they all kind of fit in this. So, if, and, and what I mean by that is that I think that George R. Martin deliberately set up two of the kings that we looked at a little bit earlier, Aenys and Magor, and wanted us to be asking ourselves who would make the better king. Is it the person who seems like a nice guy, who seems to support the arts, seems to have been a loving father to his children, um, but was a bit weak and indecisive? Or is it the guy who was uh, a brute of a man, a great warrior, um, uh, clearly a leader, but at the same time cruel and capable of horrific acts? Which of those would make the better king? And I think he's not wanting us to come up with a specific answer. Of, yeah, obviously it's that, or obviously it's that. Um, I think he's wanting us to see the upsides and downsides. So I don't think George R. R. Martin would have, is personally in the kind of the uh, hierarchy or rank. Uh, but hey, we can have a bit of fun with it. I'm sure. Uh, so uh, yeah, I will do. I will do something at the end of all of this. Um, Let's go to a question from 444. Um, did Jaehaerys have anything particular against women? Um, 
maybe saying uh, that he did may saying that he destroyed the lives of many may, maybe saying that he destroyed the lives of many women is too much but certainly didn't make life easier for some of his daughters uh, or area or Rainice or even Alison how would Jeharis's rule have been changed or different if Alison wasn't at his side for most of his life well I think I've covered a reasonable amount about the the first half of that one already um the the thought exercise about what would his rule have been like without Alison by his side is uh is an intriguing one I th I think he would have been harsher I think he would have been colder and I think um it, we would probably have remembered his rule less favorably where we see Alison most strongly involved in uh, ruling and in politics is in things that genuinely make the world better. Widows' rights, um, the abolition of the right to the first night by the, the local lord, um, caring about drinking water for the people of King's Landing, that kind of thing, when she actively gets involved. And she was also actively getting involved in the codification of the laws of the land as well. This was, uh, Jeheris called it his smaller council, him, um, uh, Alison, Septon Barth, and well, another person, the Maester, I think, um, he had a small council within a small council who were focusing in on those laws, and she played a full part in that as well. So would th this, uh, what would he have been like without her? I think he would just, a lot of the good things that we associate with him probably wouldn't have been um, possible. And also, he'd have been a lot less effective because people knew that they were so close that they were effectively were co-rulers it allowed her to be doing a lot of things um and be seen as doing them as uh, as the iron throne uh, not just as a, a random targaryen so for example when jaharis got caught up sorting out that business with bravos and pentos when he he thought, you know, if I don't, I have to do this, but that means I'm going to be um, uh, insulting the Starks potentially because we promised to go up there. Alison could just say, I'll do it. I'll go up there. And this wasn't viewed as a slight. Y yes, the, the Starks are a bit prickly, but they always are. Um, and she could go and smooth the way for him. So that happened on several occasions she basically helped him rule and without it then it would have been a, a a less good rule without it it seems very clear that the starks would probably have not been as on side as they were um he probably wouldn't have been able to do what he did down in old town quite as easily allison landing on top of the high tower was quite a boss move um so uh yeah she was absolutely integral to all that he was up to. Um, let's have a question from Vance. What do you see as Jaehaerys's greatest failure, either from a political or a personal standpoint? Yeah, I, this is an interesting one, and I would love to. I will read in the chat if you want to just drop in there what you think was his greatest failure. The Fire and Blood doesn't really record many huge failures. I, it has to be personal. It, it has to, in my view, that this is the, um, the the biggest thing was that he had twice, he had a complete breakdown in his relationship with his wife. He had a complete breakdown relationship with one of his daughters. Um, uh, he... It, that his personal relationships didn't always go well and that was clearly the the biggest part the other thing is it's not a failure it's like he didn't even ever even really attempt it if we accept the fact as i think we must that he knew this prophecy about the need to unite the seven kingdoms he was sworn in as king of the Rhoynar, he was sworn in effectively as ruler of Dawn, but he never even tried to 
to take it. He never even went made an effort in any way. Later, later on, people would try and unify them through diplomatic means, through invasion. Obviously, Aegon tried the invasion route as well, but he seems to have just gone. It's not happening. And I don't know if if he genuinely thought that the fate of the Seven Kingdoms relied on Dawn being a part of the Seven Kingdoms, then he probably should have done something about that. Uh, Kelly Summer saying, did uh, Alison ever sit on the throne like Visenya or Rhaenys? Not in the same way, no. The um, So what they did, if you think back to King Aegon, when he wasn't there, when he was off on his progresses or when he was at Dragonstone, then one or other of his sister wives would literally just sit on the Iron Throne and rule in his place. That wasn't how Alison ruled. She was there in all of everything that he did. She was by his side. She was in the small council. She went on progresses with him. He, she she was a, a mouthpiece for him a lot of the time, but she wasn't there governing in his stead in the same way that um, Senya and Rainey's were. Uh, Uzair Ahmed saying his biggest failure is how he treated his kids and his wife, family is what molds an empire. Um, uh, just having a quick flick through if anyone else has come up with any biggest, um, oh, true yellow dart saying Alison was the social worker to Jaehaerys' uh, CEO. And I think that's probably underplaying her. I think she was more, more than a social worker. I think that she was a, effectively a first minister with a social conscience um but yeah that's the, that's the um the kind of the feel um andrew k saying i'm not big on what ifs but i think it's fascinating that if Eamon and or balon one or both of them had survived both seemed quite good leadership candidates yet yeah, absolutely i would agree with that this is a two sons who did live to adulthood um and had children but they seem to get on well and they both seem reasonably good um raven's oath was king jaehaerys in love with both of his sisters um uh, no uh, i don't think so um i don't think that's the case martin s how long did it take to build king's landing um uh, oh true true i start saying well i'm a social worker so it's meant as high praise well I, I wasn't in any way trying to do down a social work. Social work is amazing work. Um, uh, but uh, so, yes, that is high praise. Uh, what I'm trying to say is wasn't that she wasn't doing the social work herself. She was uh, overseeing it and trying to change the laws and things like that. So she was the uh, that's why I say she's the minister with this, um, uh, the social the heart for social action. Um, she didn't actually get in there and um, sort things out, dig the the drains, help in individual people, uh, but she she influenced policy. Anyway, Martin S. How long did it take to build King's Landing? King's Landing was not a a, a planned city, which um, means that there wasn't a how long it took to build it. This is a this is a city that kind of just appeared. When Aegon invaded, he decided he, he would set up his first fort, the Aegon Fort, there in the place we now think of as King's Landing. There were three hills, and those three hills got named after the three of the invading Targaryens. And that he made his sort of home base. Um, as a result of that, people started moving in. Um, if you've got, if you're going to have a castle there, then you need to have some sort of infrastructure around that. Then there will be trades. They can kind of start making money, uh, making money by selling stuff to the people in the castle. Um, then their families will need to come in, and then you'll need to be having whatever needs their families have met. Food. Right. Before you know it, this grew from being just a fort to a fort with um, lots of buildings scattered in and around it. It's by the we get to the point of Jaehaerys that they're going, hang on a moment, this has just got ridiculous now. This is now a city. Nobody planned for this. This wasn't where we were. What was the aim? Aegon, when he came, didn't go, I am building a city here. 
what Jeheris did by this point was to recognise that it was a city and try and make it defendable, build the walls around it. The Red Keep had been that had been started um, uh, by Aegon and finished off by Magor, so that took place over a couple of decades or so. Um, but the city itself was sort of recognisably a city probably about a hundred years or so after the first people had settled there basically it it started out before Aegon was there it was like a little fishing port with some hills that was all that was going on so it wasn't built it just happened and then in Jaehaerys's reign that was when they built the infrastructure around it and actually tried to turn it into something that worked um Let's go to a question from TNT Group saying, finally able to catch a live stream. Thank you for your videos. Uh, hi there. Um, were the glass candles working at the time of Jaehaerys? And do you think someone will be able to light them up in the winds of winter? Well, we're not told that they were. Um, the implication is that they weren't... Um, since the uh, the Doom of Valyria. If they had been working, you would have thought that we would have heard somewhere in Fire and Blood that they were working. So there is a sort of a silence on this, is the honest answer. But will somebody be using them in the Winds of Winter? Somebody's already started using them. Um, Marwyn the Mage was using his glass candle to be keeping a track of Sam. So this is the one of the things you get that Sam chapter right at the very end, um, the Dance with the Dragons, and he sort of arrives and he's met, and uh, they the, the gang meet him and say you've got to come and meet Marwyn, and Sam's basically saying, well, how did you know I'm here? And Marwyn points at the glass candle and basically says, I've been spying in you all the way, been waiting for you. Um, and then pr promptly disappears. Marwin, a uh, great character. He's like, he comes and yes, I'm. I've been spying on you all the way. Um, now tell me all about what you know. Uh, what Maester Eamon said. On the basis of that, I'm out of here. I'm going to go find Daenerys and sort of up sticks and goes off. <coughs> so will people be using them? Absolutely, because we've now discovered that they are definitely 100% in use again. Um, the question is who uses that one will sam be using one and i i think he might i think he might this idea of him being um if if you remember if you were in like the fandom somewhere around season 6 7 there were lots of uh memes going around of sam uh becoming a wizard um in old town i don't think that's what's going to happen but you do get Marwyn the mage isn't, he's not a mage, he's a maester. But he's known as Marwyn the mage because he dabbles with magical things. And I think that we will find Sam going down that route. He will, he already has almost certainly the Horn of Winter in his possession. He will learn about magical things and that will allow him to do more magical things. And that's his, going to be his route towards magic. Um... Andrew Case saying, my point is that though Alison should be given much more credit for reforms as she practically guilted him into it, um, and and that even young he wasn't very progressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, I think it's probably not... I mean, he, he was progressive in terms of sort of tax and things like that, um, and roads and bringing stuff together, but in terms of social action, less so, it has to be said. Uh, Purple Lemonade um, saying, Hi Robert, just want to thank you for consistently giving us good content and for being great company, both uh, in both good and hard times. Well, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's uh, very kind of you to say. Uh, Lisa Dennis, my husband says he hears the guy who puts me to sleep. Uh, thanks for your relaxing voice and incredible content. Well, uh, hi there, Lisa's husband. Um, I'm Happy to be uh, to be putting uh, uh, Lisa to sleep. Um, is that weird? I don't know. Uh, but uh, um, I'm I've been told by many people that I put them to sleep. I've decided to take it as a compliment. Um, uh, let's go to. Uh, but thank you very very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, 
let's go to question from Colt Foster. Uh, hello, Robert. Big fan. First time taking the time to write out a question. There seems to be, well, welcome. Uh, uh, there seems to be some debate on whether Jaehaerys or Magor was the more skilled fighter. What's your take on this? Do you think the heavy favoring of Jaehaerys by the authors of Fire and Blood might have made him more impressive than he really was? Um, yes. Um, I mean, he was a good fighter. I think this is the the baseline is that he was taught um, by you know the master at arms. He had the sword Blackfire. The only times we see him in battle, he wins. So he is a good fighter. Um, but Magor seems pretty indomitable. Um, he he was a complete force of nature, a huge beast of a man. Um, I think if you put them up against each other, there was only going to be one winner. The thing is that Magor seem, it seems to have been more natural, more instinctive, more to do with his strength, whereas uh, Jaehaerys, he learned how to do this. He, he studied how to be a fighter. So they seem to be slightly different. The, the only little uncertainty possibility there is the fact that if you go through a song of ice and fire you will find the amount of times george r martin introduces this same kind of battle between a, a, a large fighter maybe not particularly mobile perhaps wearing armor big sword flailing around and a, a lighter more nimble fighter he does this a lot and the the lighter more nimble fighter does quite well quite often the classic example being bron when he's in the veil and he's there fighting on behalf of Tyrion against i forget the knight's name but he's there in full armor and we read the entire battle and basically bron wins it by just forcing the the knight in full armor to be moving around lots all the time and tiring him out similarly when you get uh uh, Agri Martel against the mountain. You might think instinctively the mountain should easily have defeated him, and eventually he obviously did kill him. But the victory first was for Oberyn. Um, he did get in that killing blow as well. So it's George R. R. Martin often shows the bigger, more lumbering fighter as actually losing out. So it would be interesting to see that battle. Um, uh, Andrew K saying, I meant socially, he wasn't that keen. This is about um, the, his social conscience, effectively. Um, he wasn't that keen on first night abolition without Alison's insistence and uh, drinking water. She nearly forced him to drink it. Yes. Uh, yeah. So he was, she pushed him into a lot of things in a good way. I think it's probably fair to say. Um, uh, Let's go to a question from Catherine Furseth. Um, Hi, Robert. Is there any indication that Jaehaerys was a dragon dreamer? And do we know if he considered the old Valyrian ways important? Thanks. Well, he definitely did politically. In terms of was he a dragon dreamer, the, I, I don't see any evidence of it. Um, that doesn't mean he wasn't, but I don't see any clear evidence of it um in terms of um if he considers the valyrian ways important he certainly did as i say for political reasons when we get to the doctrine of exceptionalism i think i've got a question on this um imara lee asking what the doctrine of exceptionalism is all about i've mentioned it a couple of times this was his way or one of the ways that he had to bring the faith back online he wanted an actual agreement with them about uh, as part of their doctrine um not just a this is what i think kind of thing but as part of the faith of the seven doctrine how the targaryens fit into that and the doctrine basically said um that the the faith came from Andalus. It came across with the Andals. Uh, and so, yes, this is entirely right. This was revealed to the Andals. It is entirely right that this is what 
is the uh, the the set of rules and the 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 gods that those people worship and the rules that they follow. That's all fine. However, the Targaryens aren't from Andalos. The Targaryens are Valyrian and they are different. They have different gods, but also they are genetically different. It doesn't use that words, but they are different. Part of this was they don't get diseases as easily as other folks. They, they There are still some examples of uh, Targaryens um, dying from um, disease, but a lot less than you might expect at that time. But also, they do not have to follow the moral laws that those who follow the faith of seven do because they follow their um, ancestral laws, the laws that are passed down to them from the Valyrians. So specifically incest um, and also to a lesser extent polygamy. So that's what it was. And this is what basically Jaehaerys drew this up and said, "This, I, I want this now to be what the faith of the seven believes and preaches. And he got an agreement basically with the faith um, through the means that I was talking about a little bit earlier. And he sent these seven speakers, they were called, out to across the, the land to basically big him and Alison up and say, these are great kings. These are the fantastic rulers that we've always been wanting. And by the way, yes, we know that they're brother and sister and that is a little bit icky, but hey, they're allowed to get away with it because of these reasons. And these were very persuasive speakers we're told and did manage to win around uh, the majority of the people of westeros and even there were some who weren't won around by it they um didn't in the main uh come at the targaryens anymore we get that one clear incident in maidenpool um where the the remnants of some um uh, members of the faith who were very zealous in thinking what an abomination Alison and Jaehaerys were, and so they were uh, they attacked Alison. But other than that, broadly speaking, they managed to dampen down the um, fire of the faith of the seven through this doctrine of exceptionalism. Um, the question to take this back a little bit, then, do we know if he considered the old Valyrian ways important, well, clearly important enough to do that rather than the other option, which was to say, um, okay, well, uh, we will, as of now, after this, we will forswear off of all of that. He could have done that. He could have said, yes, fine, we've married in a way that you don't like, but our children onwards, they won't, and that's all fine. He could have said that, but he didn't. And that seems to imply that he did think it was quite important. And um, let's not forget that although, yes, he had these 13 children, there still weren't that many Targaryens around because with Maegor managed to kill off a few of those who had, uh, had uh, come about the three original Targaryens had all gone, uh, Maegor himself had gone. So actually the Targaryen family line by this point was quite thin. And so if you did wish to keep this strong uh, line of inheritance, then you would have to carry on with some sort of degree of um, uh, incest. It's, so it's Maybe it's just pragmatic. Maybe he believed it. We don't get the impression that he was zealous about this. But we do get the impression that he thought it was important. Let's go to a question from uh, Martin S. In Westeros, can wars be won by dragons with riders alone, or do you need armies? How do you think a faction with a very clear advantage in dragons but no armies at all and little money would do in a war well this is the conquest basically this is uh, Aegon's conquest they did not have much of an army Dragonstone is not a big place uh, the armies that they had the navy they got from the Valarions but who was supporting them to start with the Valarions the Celtigars maybe a couple of other people but it was not big army. They won not by force of an army against another army, but with the dragons. 
the field of fire was just the dragons. They burned their opponents. Uh, what happened at Harren Hall was the dragons. Um, the uh, the battle at Storm's End the, was less uh, that because there was a storm um, and unfortunately uh, Rhaenys couldn't uh, start flying, so that was a, an army against the, uh, an army, but there's no reason to think that if they'd not just waited until the weather got a little bit better, then they could have done the same thing again. So, yes, you can do this with dragons. And what they found was that the more battles they won, the more invincible they appeared, the more armies started to join them. So um, you get, uh, for example, the reason why the Tullys were made Lords Paramount is because they were of the Riverlands, because they were not the biggest, oldest, most powerful family in the Riverlands. It's because House Tully were the first to bend the knee and give their army to the Targaryens, to Aegon Targaryen. And this happened repeatedly. People saw what was happening and said, okay, I don't actually want to face the dragons. So yeah, I'm, I'm now going to be on your side. Uh, let's go to a question from... Uh, Mara Lee, while King Magor ruled, he denied the faith of the ability to fight with arms, and when Jaehaerys came to the throne, he did the same, insisting that the crown will protect the faith. Why do you think he did this? Was this to prevent another faith uprising? Yes, it was to prevent another faith uprising. I think the other thing I would add, I talked about this just a moment ago, uh, we're talking about the exceptionalism. Um, in terms of the um, uh, ability to fight wars if he managed to get what he did succeed in doing that was eliminating the single biggest threat to the throne getting rid of the faith and it's a way of uh fighting him fighting the targaryens as we saw much later hashtag spoilers later in the D dance of the dragons a huge mass of people can take out dragons in the storming of the dragon pit. So Jaehaerys wasn't actually that worried about an army here, an army there. It was just this huge mass of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. That's the only real threat that his dragons faced. Um, and the the line uh, you you pill pulled it out there really well I think Mara saying he insisted that the crown will protect the faith this was really important because we talked earlier about how he was he was great at presenting his men uh, his image message management he didn't just say I'm you no longer can do that because I'm the boss and and I'm telling you you can't he said actually